Power and Presentation The King James Bible and the Bible Today The name of the work we're celebrating, at least the name it had in the place and time of my childhood, Authorized Version, offers an interesting oxymoron. Authorized implies, especially if we understand it as the translators of this Bible did, as both accepted by authority and as authoritative. This word sums up how this Bible came to function in the English-speaking world. Author While version suggests something less monolithic and hegemonic, for it implies at least the possibility of its plural, versions, a multiplicity of possible renderings which is always, sternly authorizing authority accepted, inherent in the idea of translation. And this multiplicity was already evident in 1611, for there were two versions of the King James Bible published in 1611. They differed in Ruth 3.15, in the apparent decision the translators had taken over whether to render the text as he or as she. There's a small textual difference there. Interestingly, despite its pe pedigree of royal approval and the politically and religiously unifying aims of the project, the translators of the 1611 Bible did not see their work so much as authorized as they were aware of it being a version among others. So, from the preface, the translators to the reader, and to the same effect say we that we are so far off from condemning any of their labours that travail before us in this kind, either in this land or beyond the sea, either in King Henry's time or King Edward's, if there were any translation or correction of a translation in his time, or King Elizabeth's of ever-renowned memory, that we acknowledge them to have been raised up of God for the building and furnishing of his church, and that they deserve to be had of us and of posterity, in everlasting remembrance. This was, from the start, a version. Yet it was, and increasingly became, authorized. But then the technology of writing takes speech, and by decontextualizing and fixing it, both takes away its personal authority, and at the same time gives it an impersonal authority. For by being fixed, these words have authority over against other words which could have been written and might have been spoken. This uh, interplay between personal and impersonal authority becomes really interesting in the ancient world in the history of letter writing, but I haven't time to go into that, even though it's in my notes. Instead, I want to explore with you a bit the interactions between the technology of writing and the various forms in which it's taken and the presentation or user interface of Bibles. First, about the earliest uh, biblical text that we have in substantial quantity, the Qumran scrolls. This is from the Isaiah scroll and it demonstrates roughly what Bible writing technology interfaces were like in around about 100 BC. There are very few helps for the reader. Plain text, though word breaks have been added which are a great help to readers, and there are paragraph breaks marking sections which are really useful for people trying to find the right section to read. So a couple of helps for readers. And the text is written on a scroll. A series of sheets that are sewn together at the edges and then rolled up around two sticks. The book of Isaiah is about as big as you can get onto a scroll. There are technical limits to the size of a scroll, mainly the stresses and strains on the sewing as you unroll the thing. Move on about a thousand years to one of the earliest complete Bibles that we had, or Hebrew Bibles that we had. It's since been partially destroyed, but it was complete once. The Aleppo Codex of 920, approximately, has far more helps for the reader, though it's recognizably similar to the manuscript of a thousand years earlier. It has word breaks, it has paragraphs, but it also has vowel and cantillation marks to help the reader, where the Isaiah scroll only had 
the consonants written, and there are Masoretic notes to help the copyist. And if we look at another example, the Leningrad Codex of a similar date, you can see in a closer up view the, the vowel points and the cantillation marks, the little dots and dashes around the letters, but you can also see that the presentation of this text, the user interface of these two texts, although they were probably written far apart and in slightly different traditions, are very similar. There is a standardized user interface for Bibles by this period. Note also that both of these are codexes. They are not scrolls, they are text where the leaves are joined at a spine. This technology, which was developed, or rather which was widely accepted around about 400 AD, is really interesting because by comparison with a scroll a codex was portable. You could contain longer texts within the bounds of a codex because the stresses on the leaves are individual rather than cumulative. And a codex allows random access. You can flip open a codex, a book as we call it, more or less anywhere you choose. These advances in technology would have a profound impact on Bible interface design. Compare the Lambeth Bible of around about 1150 or 60 or so, and so one of the uh, full flowering of medieval manuscript writing. The text presentation looks very like that of the Isaiah Scroll. The big addition are the illuminated characters, decorations in colour in the text. Compare that with the earliest print Bible. Print, you see, is the next big development in technology. It allows mass production, not mass by our standards, but mass by comparison with handwritten copies. And it makes text cheaper because of that mass production, and therefore it makes it more available. And therefore, more people can read it. But the first print Bibles of about 1452 or 3 were made to look as much like manuscript as Gutenberg could manage. Compare that with the first English print Bible, Tyndale's New Testament of 1536. Tyndale's Bible adds illustrations, so multimedia, at least two media, and notice that illustrations are different from illuminations. Illuminations decorated, illustrations have an impact on our interpretation and understanding of the text. His Bible also had cross-references, a really useful way of making use of the random access feature of the tech, of, a, of a codex text, and therefore a kind of hypertext. And his Bible had notes, fairly extensive notes. It was a sort of study Bible. It couldn't last. King Henry VIII's great Bible, the first authorized Bible in English, had no notes. King Henry was not pleased with what he called Tyndale's pernicious glosses. Many of Tyndale's notes were not complimentary about people in authority and about obedience to authority. However, the Protestant wing then produced the Geneva Bible. It, like Tyndale's, had notes, but fuller notes, and various helps like this map, to assist the amateur reader. It even has verse numbers as well as chapter headings, making it much easier to use and to find your place in for someone who is not as experienced as the users of the old handwritten manuscript Bibles would have been. For this was a Bible for the people. And this approach to Bible user interface design was highly popular. And so the Bishop's Bible of a few years later also included a kind of second English authorized version explanatory headings, chapter contents, cross-references, notes, verse numbers, and printed each verse as a separate paragraph. Pretty much the essentials of print Bible interface design had been established by this time. And they were similar for both Protestant and Catholic, as well as for the extreme Protestants and the conservative wing of the Church, as the douay Reims Bible of 1582 suggests. The biggest difference was in the content of the extensive notes rather than in their existence. The King James Bible of 1611 followed the Bishop's Bible and 
was intended to be thoroughly conservative in every sense of the word, and so it followed the king, the bishop's Bible, but with no explanatory notes, though it did include uh, translator's notes, where there were possible different readings of the text. And there you have it, a variety of English Bibles, versions, of which the King James, 1611, tries to situate itself somewhere near the middle, though it's on the conservative side of the middle. And then we move towards today, and as we move towards today we find print getting cheaper and cheaper, until, in the second half of the twentieth century, we have the possibility of a proliferation of study Bibles, Bibles with notes for every kind of person. preference or theological position. The individual Bible has come of age. But study Bibles are not without their detractors. David Lamb, author of God Behaving Badly and a biblical scholar with a blog, wrote a post on his blog, I hate study Bibles, and the post provoked more discussion than almost any post he's posted, despite the fact that he posts on some pretty controversial topics from time to time. He said, among other things, I want to invoke the curse at the end of Revelation 21, 18 to 19, which states that if anyone adds to the words of the prophecy, all the nasty things that Revelation describes will come upon them. Seems appropriate, don't you think? Why? Oh, a valid question. The comments in study Bibles appear to have the same authority as Scripture because they are printed right there on the same page. That's scary. Hence the Revelation curse. In fact, since the comments often attempt to clarify an unclear text, they seem to have more authority than God's Word. Obviously discerning readers will view the comments critically and take them with a grain of salt. But most people don't do that. I can't count the number of times during a Bible discussion someone says, Well, my Bible says... I ask, is that your Bible or a note in the margin? It's usually a study Bible comment. In my five plus years of teaching at seminary, I've read hundreds of papers that quote study Bibles in academic papers. Study Bibles comments are kind of like stuff on the internet. Sometimes the information is good, sometimes it's junk. But at least when you go to the internet, you know you're going to find some junk. You don't expect to find junk in your Bible. At least you shouldn't. Some study Bibles are relatively harmless, even helpful at times. The notes are limited and just provide context and background that most typical Bible readers don't know. But most study Bibles can't resist the temptation to speak with authority on matters that Scripture isn't clear about. Here comes that revelation curse. They often give a particular theological emphasis or interpretation. I've seen comments that attempt to lay out the correct biblical perspective on baptism, authorship of a book, spiritual gifts, women in leadership, the environment, etc. Sometimes I agree, sometimes I don't that doesn't matter. What matters is that people are inserting their theology directly into the text. This dislike, of course, is shared by many biblical scholars. A certain Tim Bulkley has said similar things on his blog from time to time. But compare what's happening here to the situation in 1611. Then a king and some bishops, whose power and authority was being challenged, objected Today it's the biblical scholars who object to the user-friendly, helpful Bible. Will these scholars be successful in their campaign against study Bibles? No more, and probably less, than Kings Henry and James with their ecclesiastical sidekicks were in their campaigns. People want and need assistance in reading Scripture. And the more accessible the text of the Bible becomes, the more widespread that need. But now we live in a world of newer technologies. For us, multi is more than two. King Tyndale and Company, multimedia meant words and pictures. But e-text can have sound, colour, movement, instant link, geolocation.
add to multimedia the possibilities that XML encoding and RSS syndication give for remixing information, grabbing information from here and there, and mixing it together in new ways and new forms. And that, together with a large database corpus that's already prepared for use with this technology, and you get something like Logos Bible Software. And then add into that mix the now near ubiquity of information as the internet and mobile phone technologies spread information access across the globe. When Barbara and I were teaching in a refugee camp on the Thai Burma border, a large proportion of the students and the other residents of the camp had mobile phones, to the extent that the mobile phone company put up a special cell tower to serve the camp because there was a market there which they could exploit. So, the question is, who will get access? Who will be the King Jameses of today, making scripture accessible to all of the people who want to access it? And what will its user interface look like? At Tyndale House, we're really privileged. We've got the books and resources for studying the Bible to any degree we want. We want to share those treasures with everyone else. One way of doing that is by software. Now there's lots of good software out there for the Bible, but it's developed mainly for the Western world. We want software which will work for everyone. And most people nowadays, the computers they carry around are in their pockets, they carry their phones. And we want something that's going to work on beefy PCs and on the tiny screen of phones. So we've made a really clean interface and we're building and putting in great resources, great data. It's exciting stuff. We call it STEP. That's scripture tools for every person. And I'm going to give you a sneaky peek at the sort of stuff we're putting in it. But everyone's used to uh, interlinear. You add Greek or Hebrew underneath the English, and it gives you a very quick grasp of how the languages are working. But what if you added text on text on text, and suddenly you've got a way of quickly comparing editions and manuscripts in a way that scholars would love, and it's so easy to do. Uh, another thing we're doing is looking at where things happened. Uh, okay, you've got scripture atlases, but they're not high resolution enough to be able to picture where things really are. Google Earth is a great tool. You can see where places are, you can see photographs of them, you can see satellite images, but you can't see how things were. You want to know where every wadi is, you want to know every stream that Sir David walked over, you want to know what sort of plants were growing in the fields he walked through. We've got a set of maps which take you into great detail. These maps were developed by the British Army when they occupied Palestine, and so the first thing they did was map everything. And they went round uh, not only seeing what the strategic points were, but where people were living and what they called the places. They went around asking people, what do you call this place with information which isn't available in any gazetteer? And when they came to a field, they marked what was growing in it. And you zoom into our maps and you find all those details there. You can see where Jesus walked. And when he walked past the field, you can see what might have been growing there. That's a project that I'm going to be involved with, helping with the Bible dictionary component. So, where have we come? Bible design follows users' needs, but good resources are and always have been costly. So the question isn't, will the Bible connect to a huge range of notes and explanations? Clearly it will and does. The question's rather, will these resources of notes and explanations and the like be presented by for-profit organizations only and at a cost to the user that can be quite significant and who will determine the content 
The question is, who will be the King James for this generation? We can no longer expect the state to do it. But we, churches, have not yet really got it into our heads that the job is ours. So, who will be the King James of 2011? <laughs>